Okay, good morning, Patrick. Um, I have with me today Patrick Jackson. He is um, an IT specialist. I'll let you talk about what your background is, Patrick, and your interest is in the phenomena. Uh, yeah, so um, basically I work as a, a, I'm a database guy. I work in SQL databases. Um, and a big, big part of that is a thing called reverse engineering, uh, where we take uh, existing processes and we reverse engineer how it all works, uh, which can then make, uh, make you replicate it or do it or modify it, uh, document it and so forth and stuff like that. Um, and it's nothing special to be fair in the, in the IT world, everyone, everyone does it. It's nothing, I'm nothing out of the ordinary. Uh, it's just the, the only thing that's different is I spent a lot of time using the same thought process on uh, poltergeists um, originally. Um, and that was my uh, interest. I wanted to figure out, if, well, I just wanted to find out if I could figure it out. Well, I grew up in a fairly paranormalish area, like people will see, uh, you know, figures and ghosts and, and so forth, and UFOs as well. Um, I used to see these little balls of light going over the uh, streetlights at night. And uh, it was like every Friday night, uh, they would just cruise over. And um, then one day I was sitting on the, on the swing, uh, actually waiting for the pub to open. And I just looked across the field and there's this guy standing there as a monk with his hood up. And I had a, a, like a laser at the time. And I um, pointed the laser at him and it bounced off his chest and his legs and his face, everything. So it was like solid, it was there, you know. So I was like, well, I just thought it was a nutter, you know, kind of like um, uh, trying to pull a prank on me or something. You know, this is like a, a guy dressed as a monk in the middle of a playing field uh, at like seven o'clock at night. And um, so I got up, I got up and started walking towards him uh, to kind of like square up to him or, or confront him to say, what are you doing, you know, you weirdo. And he disappeared. I got, I got within like 10, 10 feet of him or something and he just disappeared. And I was like, oh, that's a bit, <laughs> that's a bit weird. <coughs> so. <clears throat> vanished into thin air. It just. Yeah. And just um, off, he just vanished. Yeah. Yeah. And this is in the middle of a field, you know, so it's not like you can just disappear off anywhere. It's like in the middle of an open, like a football field, you know. And uh, I just said to some of the locals later that later that week, I said, oh, I just thought, thought I saw like a, a guy across the field, like dressed as a monk. And he goes, oh, yeah, 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 that's a mad monk. He, he haunts here and stuff. And I was like, what? So I was like, that completely blew me away because I was like, I'd never heard of that in my life. And I'd never really been into the paranormal or ghosts and stuff. I, you know, all my, all my teenage years and my early 20s, I never gave a, a second thought about this stuff. Uh, until I actually saw it. And after that, I kind of thought, well, it's always, it's always been an interest, like what, what was going on there? Um, so for years, I've been studying it, like passively, I've been watching all the TV shows and, and stuff like that. But the, the truth is, is that none of the, the mainstream paranormal shows, as in, you know, the ghost ones, make any sense to me. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever because um, the behavior patterns that you see in these solid houses are all the same. Um, you have the same effects, the same mechanisms at work. Um, and they try and pin it on someone who lived there 200 years ago. And I'm like, that doesn't, just doesn't add up in my head. And um, so after a lot of watching and stuff, I, I, I just couldn't, couldn't kind of accept it anymore. And I thought, well, I'll just, just see what I can figure out because, you know, if I can do the stuff at work, if I just, if I apply the same kind of thought process to this, let's see what I can find, you know? So, and so I did. Let me stop you there for a moment. Um, people will question um, the, the belief that it's a very strongly held belief that these are dead mm. people. Um, you write about this quite clearly, and I'd like you to share what you've written about the logic behind why it cannot be dead people. Oh, that's a good one. So, for instance, uh, one mechanism is EVP, which is a common one, right? But why is it the same mechanism? Sorry, EVP, for those who are not familiar with the terms, is what, what is that? Uh, electric uh, voice phenomena. 
Yes. So basically when you're recording like on a tape or a, a camera and you hear a voice clear as day, but you, you don't actually hear it at the time. Um, so you're hearing these voices around the place and, uh, and words, people are saying things to you and, and you don't actually hear it yourself. Uh, in fact, you might be in a room on your own and you'll hear another voice talking or you'll hear your own voice talking, even though it's not your voice, if you understand, or that mimics your voice. Um, and so I was looking into that and it's like, well, that, for example, how you replicate that is, um, they, well, in, in the, the mainstream, they use spirit boxes or basically just radios or people pick up voices on and they, they, they say they're talking to a ghost. Well, the only way you can replicate that is through um, a thing called electronic crosstalk. So what you have is a, is a basically, it's either a microwave or a directed radio wave, which is very, very powerful. And it's basically um, being directed at the, um, at, the spirit, at, the, at the transmitter, the receiver. And then what happens then is it, it gets picked up as electronic crosstalk on the circuit, which then overrides background noise, which then comes across through the, through the system. So it's a lot like, um, you know, when you have like a, uh, like a guitar amp and you, you can pick up radio on it. It's the same kind of thing. It's electronic yeah. crosstalk. Right. So when, uh, yeah, so, and also uh, in haunted houses, there's always these, the same uh, patterns that are occurring. So people will feel sick, they start fainting, um, they get nauseous, get headaches. Um, they hear footsteps around the room. Um, especially in the attic or the basement. Um, things will happen like it will be random, almost like random, as in uh, nothing will happen for three months and basically something big will happen, like you'll bang the door downstairs and everybody runs downstairs. Uh, so these behavior patterns are not constant with human behavior. Humans are pack animals. We are much more, you know, um, sociable. Of all, you know, I've, I've, had, I've had some family members in the past that you know they they chat they talk non-stop so if, if they were a ghost they would be telling me all about it non-stop <laughs> you know <clears throat> so that's what i mean the, the behavior patterns that you see in these buildings just doesn't make any sense uh at least as a, from a human perspective um and that's why it's kind of like you're always chasing a tail in there yeah you know, that's why would, that's why for, for years uh paranormal investigators although they've been you know they're great people and stuff they it feels like they're chasing their tail because they go in there and they get a little bit of something and then it all stops and they get a little bit of something else and it's upstairs and it's downstairs and but they don't actually find anything it's just always a cat and mouse game you understand yes. and I'm, I'm sure you've kind of like experienced that yourself well just only in watching um um i don't watch the paranormal um tv shows particularly but right. in passing i've i've noticed that it's um very scant information. It, I don't yeah. find it satisfying and I very quickly get bored, sorry to the paranormal investigators, but yeah, it does seem to be, seem to be the same thing over and over. Yeah. So we, I was in there, I was in, um, I, I basically rented out a place called 30 East Drive, which is um, known to be the most uh, haunted house in the UK, was voted to be the most haunted house in the UK. And it's only a tiny place as well. So it all happens on the stairs and upstairs. And it's really small. So you can hear the whole, everything going on around you all the time. And this place, I'm not, I'm not joking, but this place is so bad that you wouldn't be able to live in there for a month on your own. You wouldn't be able to do it. Um, even the police refuse to go into this place. And in what, uh, way, so basically, in what way is it bad? It's just so, so active, like banging on the doors, objects being thrown around. Mm -hmm. uh, figures being seen, walking, movement, or, or everything, everything that will just freak you out. But also, you feel really ill as well. You know, people start feeling faint, they get headaches, they get nauseous. Um, so you get all these effects in a very small area. So it's a really, it's a really good um, place for me to kind of study. Uh, and that's what I did. So I went in there and I, I took a camera crew and stuff to document it all so I could really think about it. Um, and it confused the hell out of me for about four or five, about four days. I was in there, it confused me real badly. Why, why? The first night we were in there, we we're upstairs and the, the coal shed door downstairs banged like, dong, 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 really, really heavy. So we all go rushing downstairs and there's no one there. And then we spend the next three or four hours 
asking it to do something else and it doesn't do anything. You know, but at the same time, I'm getting like weird pains in my head. And actually over the, the four days then, my, I got started getting brain swelling. My brain started swelling in my skull. Um, this is like is in Walker Ranch, what, what happened to this, one of the staff there, the same, the same effect. The yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and I didn't know what it was at the time, but it, it, uh, it, it's actually quite dangerous. Um, and um, so when, once I left, it took, you know, afterwards I found I was a little bit neurologically damaged as well. I felt my I, like I used to be able to see really clearly in the dark, but now I don't. Now I'm quite, I get quite a lot, lot of uh, night blindness. Um, so, uh, yeah, so before before my little my long stint in, in East Drive, I could see really well, and then afterwards I just couldn't. So it was like something has changed in my in my brain. Something has been damaged, you know. Um, so what? So after I've been thinking a lot about it and looking at the footage, and um, this is this is how crazy I got. I was staying after work uh, from five till seven, half seven every night, uh, looking at footage, things, and trying to work stuff out. You know, for a good year, I was doing this, you know, real hardcore. And this is like in front of, you know, computers and screens and all sorts of things I could use in databases. I was trying to figure out, you know, what it could be. Um, and then finally, uh, I got hold of a picture from a friend of mine and I put it through some image software and it came out as a small silver ball, which was hovering just above the floor. And when I saw that, it just clicked. I was like, oh, fuck. You know, it literally was that. I, I actually started shaking because it was so overwhelming what I realized what it was. Um, and what it what it is, is a smaller variant of the Foo Fires. Okay. So basically during World War II, um, the Air Force came into contact with the Foo Fires, which are these small silver balls up in the sky and they operate in swarms. And the same, the same objects, but a smaller variant of it operates in buildings. And you think, well, why is there a, a, a small, you know, like a drone in a building? Doesn't make any sense. Why, why, would, why would it be here? So I thought, well, okay, I'll, I'll, I got an idea. So I thought, well, drones, they use one of these, one of these three things. One, they, they, use, they, are, they need a network. And two, they're receiving and, re and sending signals. And, and three, they use AI. So I thought, okay, I'll, I'll, try, I'll have a look at that, see what I can find there. So I basically mapped all the haunted areas of the UK and put them into a database. How many were there in the UK that you found? Um, approximately, I can't remember, it's around about 170. 100. Like, but what I, what, I was, what I was mapping was the real hardcore places where you can't live, you know, where you, you cannot actually live there. I'm not talking about like some little bar that has something happen once in a blue moon. I'm talking about the places that you really just can't live there. Okay. Um, I mapped them all and I thought, oh, look, look at that. And basically right in the middle of the country in the, in the UK, there's a line in the middle and it follows like, a, like, like this. And they're all exactly the same distance apart. And when, it, when I saw that, it all clicked again because that replicates our own microwave-based relay systems. Okay. So these drones are communicating via microwave relay, which is why everyone's getting headaches because oh. it's, it's high energy emissions um, and feeling sick and so forth. And I thought, okay, so what are they relaying? They're relaying across the country, right? So why, why are they doing that? And then I realized that the, the Foo Fires, the bigger ones, they're at 100,000 feet. And what they're doing is that they're relaying downwards to the ground to these smaller ones in buildings, then relaying back up again. So it's like a satellite, but in reverse. So we use satellites to send signals up and down to the earth. They use signals down and broadcast back up to the others. Yeah, have you set up equipment to discover the bigger ones? Or? Oh, we've, we've, we've um, well, we've got one. We, we got hold of one, we crashed. Okay, tell me about that. Uh, well, we actually, we know where two are, um, but one is broken up. That's been through material analysis. And the second one is intact. And because of all the lockdown, we haven't managed to analyze that one yet, 
but as that is, well, it is also one because it has all the same features. It's so, also emitting gamma rays as well. So when you say we, who is that? You and? I, I have a small team. Okay. So it's not just me on my own. Right. I have a, I work with Steve, he's a material scientist in the US. Uh, and also I have software developers over here. And also I have a, a bunch of IT specialists as well who help me out, who actually agree with my analysis and help me out as well. Fantastic. Okay, so you've you've got hold of um, some spheres. Continue on that. So um, what they're doing, as I said, they're relaying to the ground and then up again. Mm -hmm. So what what what's actually going on in these houses is it's like a drone in a house, right? That is like a transponder which only switches on and off when it needs to. So if I say five days of the week or do nothing, it'll just be switched off. But you, you can't see it because it uses, you know, some uh, clever camouflage. But um, it switches off, and then what happens is, is that when the signals come down, it comes up back online, and that's when it powers up and then starts doing high high energy emissions between it all, um, or relaying because signals are coming down and then back up again. And when once these emissions are, are are going on, that's when people are picking up high energy EMFs in the building. That's when people start feeling ill. That's when it starts, you know, they start getting effects from the emissions. So then what happens is, is once the emissions get to a point where they're so high, what it does, it causes diversions to move people away. You get it? So yes. these things are operating in one of one or two places, either the attic or the basement. Mostly it's in the attic, depending on what type of building it is. Um, in wooden buildings, they operate in the basement. And then, uh, like in America, they have these wooden like buildings, single floor wooden buildings. They operate in the basement because it's the most shielded area. Okay. And then in, in modern buildings, they use the attic because that's shielded enough. Um, so once uh, the emissions get to a point where it's so high, they will, they will bang, say, the door downstairs. In East Drive, it bangs a cold shed door, right? But when you actually look on the, um, the floor plan of the building, you'll notice that that area is actually the most shielded part of the building. So if you're gonna pump out a load of gamma rays and microwaves, you will put people in that area. Okay. And that's why it's, it's, that's why people haven't really got anywhere with the paranormal for so long, because they've been thinking about human in a human way, when in fact you've got to be thinking in a machine way. Okay. So this is the thing is, is that, um, all it's trying to do is keep you away from high energy emissions. So you'll do things, you know, it could be anything um, to keep you in an area or to, uh, so like it will, it will make a milk bottle explode in your, in your kitchen to keep you in the kitchen for a while, okay. while the emissions are going off. But so then once it's shut down, it, will, it all stops. The question is, who do they belong to and why are they engaging in this behavior? What are they communicating? And that's quite interesting. You have some thoughts on that based on some deeper study that you've you've done. Um, well, in um, in the in 30 East Drive, um, I got hold of an image of this guy with a very long elongated head, so like his skull goes back. Um, and the only place we see that um, is in the pyramids. Mm. So if it's those guys, I don't know, but it. That's the only other place we've seen that kind of skull configuration. So you, um, you captured an image. You've got a copy of that image somewhere. Yeah, yeah, we've got it. It's in the group actually. Yeah, and um, also when we do our own tests, mm. uh, that's what we see. What comes up on our, our, our images, which is guys with long heads, um, and that's uh, I got another image of that in my group as well. Um, so what what they're actually doing is is. Uh, they, the seers themselves, up, which are 100,000 feet, what they're doing is controlling access to Earth's airspace. Uh, what, what, so the big question is, like, where are all the aliens? Well, these guys are keeping them out, or at least trying to. Okay. Because what it really is, you see, people have this um, dreamy kind of idea about aliens and this all, we know, love and games and stuff. But uh, the only reason why other groups will come here is for genetics. That's it. They don't come here to to shake hands or you know be friendly or anything else. 
they come here for a specific reason, and that is genetics. Um, so in the, in the same way, like when it comes to our own world, the way we treat the animal kingdom, we don't go, you know, and live with the monkeys. I mean, some people do, but most people don't, but we do want to know about their genetics. So we will go and dart one and sample his blood and let him loose again. And that's, and that's what goes on. So in a way, they, they come here for genetics, uh, for, for the extraction of DNA, because DNA is probably, is what appears to be the, the but it is the only unique resource on the on earth. So when, I mean, if you wanted um, metals or, um, or materials, you go to asteroids, because there's a, uh, you've got huge, you know, rocks of titanium or lithium or all these other crazy chemicals and, and, uh, or materials. Uh, so you wouldn't come to earth. You'd only come here for genetics. So what, what's actually going on, there's two groups, um, according to the defense industry anyway, uh, there's two groups. And one's called the uh, Wranglers and the other one's called the Rustlers. So the Wranglers, what they do, they um, look after the cattle and we're the cattle in a sense. Uh, and the rustlers take the cattle, so and that's what this the, that's what this 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 this, this, this system does. That's so, a quote um, from somebody um, prominent that you've you've uh, cited in your book. Who was it that made that statement first? That the that's idea. Boyd of... Okay, tell me more yeah. about him. He's a Lockheed Martin uh, senior scientist yeah. um, who died a few years ago. But uh, he, he, he was fairly open about this stuff. And uh, the thing about Boyd is that, or these people, they don't, they, when they don't have to say much to, to say a lot. So when, when I was listening to him, how he, what he was explaining, he can, what he said in just a few words was actually means a lot. It's just people, most people just don't think about it, but that's what he can do. Um, so that's what kind of put me on the path of, you know, what's going on with this, because it kind of linked to these fears while kind of how I was modeling it in my head. So what's happening is, is that uh, the, the um, Wranglers group is trying to keep the Rustler group out. Yeah. It's that simple. Um, you might have heard about um, human mutilation. Yes. Yeah, and which, the, the mutilation matches animal mutilation. Yep. The same process, same machine, same group. How many cases of human mutilation um, are documented? I think it's about 40, isn't it, worldwide? I think it's quite a lot. Quite a lot. So is it more or less than that? I think it's quite a lot. Um, it's just not mentioned. OK. Uh, you can't blame them, really. No. But it hard. is, it, it, it is um, I think it happens quite a lot. Um, and really what it is, is these, the, the other groups will come in here to try and get some, basically a, gen, a genetic resource, which will be me or you or someone else. And they'll just grab them and then sample, you know, everything off them, which kills them in the process. Um, and then they leave as fast as possible. Uh, and what these spheres have been doing, and also they've been getting deployed more and more over the years, uh, they are doing their best to keep these other groups out. And the byproducts of the system is polygast activity. Yeah. So it's a it's a, a decoy to keep us monkeys um, <laughs> diverted from from what really is happening. So what's happening is it is a when when the uh, the, the sea is up up about hundred thousand feet, they, they detect something. Mm. They can't talk to each other because yeah. if they send a signal. The, uh, the target will detect them, right? So what they do is they, sig they direct the signals down to the, the ground, and which then redirects upwards. Uh, we use the same kind of process with our stealth uh, aircraft. It's while the, where the stealth aircraft's in the air, it will send a signal up to a satellite, which then relays it to another satellite down to the Pentagon or wherever. But these use the ground. So they will send a signal downwards and then upwards. And then, so what happen is, be a big V and that's why people are seeing these big V's in the sky because you have two two spheres here and then you have a ground relay here and this one here is relaying down to this one and then uh, they, are, they are then scanning up here and then what they do is they'll go up and then they close in on the target 
by this. Um, and then they basically either tell it to leave or it gets blown up. Uh, and that's what um, you might have seen all, like on the, on the YouTube. It's nothing on the news really, but on YouTube, you know, these people have been seeing these things falling out of the sky. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's what they are. They're, they're, they're blowing ships up and they land okay. somewhere remotely. Right. Yeah. I know someone who's seen a formation of spheres. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's very interesting. She's shown me the video of that. It uses scarecrow-like tactics to push people away from high energy emissions. Okay, so that's that how it works. So in the same way, like if you went back in time and you'll yeah. see some, you know, say like the 15th century, and you saw some child running around with a bit of uranium, which is pissing out radiation, mm -hmm. um, you but you couldn't speak its language. You can't show yourself to him. So what do you do? You have to scare them. You have to, you have to do things to say, look, just get out of here, you know. Um, and that's that's what it is: a scarecrow actions to to move people away from high energy emissions. Uh, and the way that's done, by the way, you know, with the eyes or all that kind of stuff, all it really is is is, uh, is sending a signal into your brain and makes you hallucinate. Uh, so to you, it's just like it's really happening, but it's actually a hallucination. Um, and that's that has been seen also here. Uh, I remember a story where these people were in a pub, and uh, the pub was haunted, and they said it was haunted, and uh, everyone saw this little girl uh, run through the pub. So they said, "Oh, that's strange. She just disappeared." So they looked at the CCTV camera, and they saw a ball of light. Ooh. So what's happening is is that these objects are giving off like a broadcast, which will basically uh, create a um, a diver diversionary image, um, basically to hide within. Okay, so that doesn't work on everyone. Um, I was at a um, a, a locally um, organised uh, Ghostbuster event where there were a lot of people, some that were very connected with the par paranormal scene, um, and some there was a, there's a a place here uh, along the coast, a hotel um, that's quite that's been around for a long time since the colonisation of Melbourne, basically, and um, it's known to be a haunted hotel. Um, and people explain that you know there are lots of characters here, and there's a resident ghost, and um, there's an area where, where the staff is, find it's quite creepy to work, and strange things go on. Um, and anyway, a group of people came to check this, this place out. And some of them reported seeing an orb in a corner. I couldn't see anything. Why is it that some people, like I'm really, um, <laughs> I've never seen anything like this. Some people are very um, perceptive and, and can pick up this phenomena more easily than others. So I might, might, just, it might just be, yeah. It might just be that. Um... Some people are more sensitive to infrared than others. Okay. Because you can you can see these you can see these orbs under infrared, mm. um, and that's what NASA uses from the from the space shuttle. Uh, they they see these uh, these orb UFOs using the infrared cameras. Okay. Um, so you can see the see them with infrared. So uh, they're infrared blind. <laughs> but this it might just be that you're just not as sensitive mm. as others. That's all. You might and be sensitive to other areas, but not. So also people report, um, or we have a mutual friend that sees stuff, but his wife doesn't, or they may be sitting in the same room and he doesn't perceive things in the same way that he, he does. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of that where one person will, or two or three people will see something and a, a number of others that are there at the same place at the same time and not seeing it at all. And this mm. This is what the debunkers hang on to that it's not really there and the the people that are seeing it have got something wrong with them and are hallucinating how do you explain that patrick yeah so what's actually happening is is that the seers themselves have an insert and extract process mm -hmm. um and this is observed when you see uh, objects will disappear and fall through the ceiling you know which happens in east drive as well and we've got it on tape where i think it's a, a candle just falls through the ceiling and lands on the floor uh, it also does the same with fruit as well and, uh, and all sorts. The same thing occurs in the, in the woodlands as well, and they call it gifting. 
um, and what that is is that the these seers what they appear to be able to do is insert and extract living living people from these buildings, right? But what they do is they test it first with objects. So they first test it with like an apple or an orange and it falls through the ceiling and it lands on the floor and they go, okay, it works fine, we'll, we'll send someone through. So what's happening is that they're dropping people through which are not from here, but they're dropping them through or, or they're extracting them. Um, and they're using um, photonic um, stealth which means that they're bending light waves around them. So you can't see them, but you can pick them up through their um, weight and mass. So if you put vibration like these little cat balls on the floor, which basically pick up vibration um, in 30, people can just be sat there like not moving and suddenly they'll just go off because basically someone's walked by, but they can't see them, but they can pick up the weight and mass because light is actually quite easy to mask within is but weight and mass isn't it's impossible to hide so this is why people hear footsteps in buildings but you can't see anything because but the interesting thing is is that from what i found is that what the stealth technology they use is particularly tuned to visible light which is only a tiny part of the spectrum if you use deep infrared and you're close enough, you can actually see the outlines of them. Yeah. And we've actually got that on tape as well. Okay. Where people sat there, yeah. So it's what you're actually dealing with is, it's like when Elon Musk said, um, he says, maybe they walk among us. And in fact, they do. It's just, we can't see them. Oh, that's Bob Bigelow that said that. Yeah. And Elon Musk, yeah. Yes. Oh, did Elon Musk say that too? I yeah. wasn't aware of it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's that's what you're dealing with. And so some people actually could come out, might be able to see them, mm. uh, while other people can't. Okay. Um, but that's what it is. It's advanced um, optical stealth, uh, which some people might be able to see deeper into than others. And that's probably why you you get people, like you say, where the some like the the husband will see it and the the the, the wife will not. Oh, thank you. That's a good explanation. Okay, so where can we go from here? Um, what else have you discovered about this? Oh, the, um, oh, I can't remember the name of the silver ball that um, appeared to a family, a family discovered a silver ball in their household. And I think that was in the 80s, was it? Mm. Tell me about that. <coughs> You're talking about the Bet Sphere? The Bet Sphere, yes. Mm. Tell, talk to me about that one. Uh, yeah, so they found, uh, they, I think they're in a farm um, off the top of my head, and uh, there was like a, a lightning storm that night, and mm -hmm. there was a big explosion. And uh, they, one of the guys went out and they found this little silver ball in the middle of like the field. And they took it home, um, and they had no damage on it. It looked like it literally just landed softly. Okay. <laughs> and um, they took it home, and then after a few days, guess what happens? Starts moving around. No, polygast activity starts. Oh, is that right? Mm. I, I do remember reading about it moving around to the sound of a guitar. It does that as well, yeah. yeah. Mm. So tell me about yeah, the well. polygast activity that it was provoking. They, was, they were getting um, door slamming, banging, mm. all, all this stuff. Um, typical polygast activity, you know, mm -hmm. uh, random. And it got so bad, they actually, you know, almost... Uh, I think they gave it to the US Navy for analysis. And they kind of, um, they looked at it and they x-rayed it and they, they said that they, it had an atomic number of around 144 to 155, which we, which we can't produce. Um, I mean, we can produce elements up to that, we, uh, you know, up, up and past that, but we can't produce it on mass. So we can't actually make anything with them. We can only make one or two atoms in, a, in an accelerator. So when, you, when they say that this ball has an atomic number of 140, 155, it means we can't actually make it. Um, so that's what it is. And basically, we found another one. Like I call it the Bet Sphere 2. You know, I found, I found another one, um, a family who has it. And uh, exactly the same thing. So they put it on the floor and it will roll itself around. It's like a, you know, like a little AI bot. It shakes, it vibrates all day. 
um, in its gamma rays. Um, yeah. Oh, so we've got where, another one now. Where is this one? This is in the UK that you found this in one? In the US. Oh, another one in the US. And when did, was that found and where? 30 years ago. 30 years ago? Mm. Okay. I think it's 30, maybe 40. It could be 40, actually. Okay. Uh, 40 years ago. But I say 30 to be on the safe side. Right. Um, yeah, and it's actually been in his shed for a long, long time. Um, and he just gets it out and polishes it for a while, rolls it around and puts it back in the shed again. You know, um, he didn't actually know, know what it was until I, I kind of come to my conclusions and then got in touch with him. Did they also have activity, poltergeist activity in the shed? Not I'm aware of, not yeah. I'm aware of, but the thing is uh, basically offline. It's in, it's basically, it's, it's fully intact and it's, it's, um, it's, it looks like it just hasn't been switched on. Yeah. So, well, I think the, the Betsier one was switched on. It was just broken. Okay. You know, um, so that's where we are, and that's, we're going to get that one tested soon. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's like all these things, it's all down to budget. Like, if I had, if I was given a budget of, say, even, let's say, £100,000, yeah, which is nothing in the big scope of things. It's quite easy to figure this stuff out because now we know it's a drone. Now we know it's emitting and sending signals. All we have to do is rig the house for the sensors uh, or, and also outside the sensors. And, and then we can see what's going in and what's going out and when. And then you have like telescopes to look what's going on in the sky above you at the same time. And it should all sync up. Do you think that wrong. whoever's running these systems would um, <laughs> catch on to the fact that you're trying to uncover it and perhaps interfere with your, your studies of it? To be honest with you, it, it, it's, um, I, don't, I, I don't think that's the case. Mm. Uh, um, I think um, I get the feeling that it, it, it's going to come out anyway, sooner or later. Because I'll tell you why, because um, like, take mobile phones, for instance, you know, um, soon they will have night shot on them, so you can look at the stars, right? And you'll be like, you know, looking for uh, like a decent night vision scope. And when that happens, you'll be able to see these objects flying around. So it's going to come out anyway in the next few years. Uh, and they're so common now that it's, it's almost like they're everywhere. Every day I have new videos of these things somewhere doing stuff. And it's, it's, it's almost, you know, it, <laughs> it, it's so obvious that it's, it's, it's kind of funny. Even from the ISS, there's in from the ISS, there's this footage of like a large, uh, like an object coming in and then suddenly all the seers come in to surround it. Things that the US Navy is talking about mm. is what other seers. The, the things that's tracking the US Navy you know, are the type three seers, okay. the ones that are the ground relays. Um, okay. That's what they're talking about. That's what's all these pictures from the US Navy are the seers in action. And the, what's happening is, is that the US Navy are detecting an object. So they go and fly to have a look at the object. When they get there, these seers are surrounding the object. And that's what's in these pictures. Right. Very interesting. So it's basically they're intercepting it before the, um, the US Navy does. Okay. So we're having constant visitation and um, it's like um, mm -hmm. the earth is a, an organism that has a defense system, like we have uh, the white blood cells that attack a, a foreign intruder. It's these spheres seem to behave as part of a function that um, alerts alerts um, the presence of something that shouldn't be there. Is this this is what you're discovering? Yeah. 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 Basically, yeah. 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 I mean, the the spheres themselves are artificial in nature. They're machines. Mm -hmm. They're drones. Um, they use uh, what I can tell. Uh, they use um, a thing called rule-based artificial intelligence, uh, which means that they have a, a set of observations that they look out for, and then a set of pre-coded um, actions. So they, most of the time they can run anonymously. They can just uh, whiz around and, and do stuff. 
Uh, but I think now and again they're taken over manually as well. And the thing is, because they operate in buildings as well, as in haunted houses, um, I developed a code that, that, tricks, that, that uh, triggers them into action. So you play the code in the house and suddenly people start getting what they call par uh, paranormal activity. And it, it starts within literally two minutes. So what do you think, have you pondered what is happening in Skinwalker Ranch? So the, the spheres themselves, they use three networks from how I, how I can model it out. Mm. The um, first you have, say like you have them up, up in the atmosphere, mm. one will send a signal to the other directly, like a microwave, right? So it's what you call like a peer-to-peer, -peer, right? So it's direct, direct communication. Uh, then when they detect something in the middle, they will, they will uh, signal downwards to what I call the dynamic network, which is these uh, type three objects in, in buildings, type three spheres in buildings. Um, that is, by the way, by the way, this is why paranormal activity does not increase or decrease. It just moves around, you see. And uh, so if the building gets knocked down, the objects will go, well, I can't relay from here anymore. So I'll just find another building. So it adapts, yeah. that's how it rolls. So um, that's the type, that, that's the second network. And then you have a um, like a, a large, a high bandwidth um, ground-based network. So at Skinwalker Ranch, they were picking up high-energy uh, microwaves and gamma rays surrounding. They were up on the hill, and they they were like detecting them all around them, moving around. And that's what it appears to be is is Skinwalker probably, and there's probably a few more of them as well around the world. Uh, which are basically like the, the main uh, underpinning network hubs. So that's where the bulk of the data goes through, which means that whoever's controlling it is actually on the earth. So um, I think you were um, linked to Martin Willis and um, one of the callers was um, uh, at the end of the John Ramirez interview uh, reported seeing some orbs, some orange orbs, but I think I think he was saying when he looked up at them, he could see that there was a, a silver ball. So please explain the, the connection between the Foo Fighters, the orange balls that people have seen during World War II and, and for many years afterwards. I mean, that's probably the most commonly seen unidentified aerial phenomena, the orange ball. So the color comes from um, electronic gas interaction, right? So what it means is, is that, um, when you have a high energy uh, source in the sky, well, it, it will, the, the field will interact with the gas uh, surrounding it. It's basically um, a lit electronic gas interaction, right? So when the different, it's like, uh, you know, like neon, right? How that works. So it's basically a high energy uh, volts charge with the gas, and then you get the, the color, the, the gas will ignite, and that's where you see the color, right? It's the same mechanism as lightning. So when, when you see lightning strikes, you get a big flash. That's a, what they call atomic lights. So it's electrical gas interaction, a high energy uh, source in, the, in a gas environment will uh, interact with the gas molecules and emit photons. So the different frequencies of the light, the energy levels at, um, and also what gas they're passing through at the time will determine the different colors that you see. So if you look at these orb pictures, or people say spirit orbs, they're all the same. There's like a range of colors they are, right? They're all atomic colors. Okay. Yeah, because it's a high energy source in a gas environment. And then the, the actual, the, the high energy um, is going across the shell, which is interacting with our gas environment, which is then releasing photons, which is light. And so you get a real nice, like constant, um, like crystal clear light going, going across the sky. And that's, that's what it is. So we have here in the Australian outback the Min Min light, which yeah. I think has been reported um, by the local people um, for as long as they've been around. So what is it? Have you been able to make a connection between what the Min Min light might be and, and what you're studying? Yeah, it's the same thing. It's um, the type three seers. So they, the type three will always be those of ground. Mm -hmm. And that's what the Min Min lights are because they're transmitting up to uh, the others, which are approximately 100,000 feet up in the sky, maybe higher. Um, 
so but they they need to operate near the ground uh and that's what it is that's what it is so what you what people will see would be like a ball of light sitting just above a road um or just hovering there like static and then it'll move around a bit and then it will just start off um and what that is doing is basically joining joining the network because it's it, generally they bounce up in the sky like this and then they move around like this a bit and what it's doing is just trying to get the network and then it will then get locked lock on the network and then it will start relaying and then once it's done then it will leave um but as i say when people see these things you've got to be careful because uh, they're giving off high energy emissions, which so if you get close to it and it gives off like a gamma ray burst, you might get hit and you might get ill, uh, which means you get cancer. So whenever you see these objects, you always need to keep your distance, um, not just you know go up there and try and give it a, a hug, you know. Uh, <laughs> that's that's, that's, that's really, and that's that's why these objects always generally operate at certain heights above cities and or above um, above people. They're also roughly around about 100 feet up. You don't really see them much lower than that. Um, but rarely you do, but most of the time they're about 100 feet up. Gosh. And that's in to do with the um, inverse square law of radiation. So when you have a high radiation, say, burst, the further you are away from it, the safer it is. Uh, and that's why it's the same process as in haunted houses. So when it's doing its a high energy burst up in the attic, it will move you down to the, the furthest place <coughs> because the radiation emission by the time it gets down there, is safe. So the advice is to <coughs> keep away from haunted houses. <laughs> we'll go in there, but it's like, you gotta just, just um, but just don't I have to have high, a, a lot of exposure. So you go in there maybe once a year or once every three months, mm. but then go every every other day or every once a week. Uh, I think you're gonna have problems. That, that's why there's a, I think there's a, a mental illness um, problem in the, the paranormal community uh, because the overexposure to the fields. Um, so it causes depression, causes all sorts of other problems. Um, yeah, so that's what I think it is. So you're saying that in the paranormal community, there's a um, disproportionate amount of um, um, yeah. effect. Yeah, uh, does appear to be, yeah. Mm, okay, that's very interesting. Which is interesting because of the findings, I think, from um, from was it the Pentagon, the, the papers that were released, they said that a lot of the pilots were having brain damage when they were close, in close uh, proximity to these UFOs. Uh -huh. So, uh, yeah, the high energy fields, you know, you're, you're dealing with very, very high energy fields. And if you if you get too close, you, you could have a problem. OK. Oh, that's disturbing. Um, but I guess now that we know what you've discovered, we know to be cautious. Um, the hitchhiker effect, what can you tell yeah. us about um, this? So that happens a lot in the in uh, where, I, where, I, my, where I'm studying. Um, in fact, uh, the people who steal stones off the driveway mm -hmm. and they take it home and only to find that they eat, uh, mail them back with a letter of saying, I'm sorry, I, I, I stole the stone. Because when they took the stone home, the house became active. Oh, okay. Even though they live miles away, yeah. even though they might have taken a train, a tube, and a, you know, whatever, um, in a very complicated, long-winded route home, the home become active within three or four days and it was so bad they send stones home so stones back to uh, the location so what that is is this from from what i can model out is uh well these these objects they have a um a very exotic propulsion system uh and as i said they're pumping out high energy emissions now the question is can we detect all these emissions and the, the answer probably is no Right? In the same way as a 15th century or 14th century scientist wouldn't be able to detect you know, certain radiation we can now. Okay. So what I think is actually occurring is that when these uh, objects say in a building for a long period of time, they contaminate the actual surroundings. So they contaminate wood, contaminate stones, contaminate you know, anything, anything within its range. So if you, if you take something which is contaminated and move it away to another location, uh, I think these 
these other seers that are, that are roaming around can detect it. And then what they do is they go, oh, that, sh that shouldn't be there. So let's go and have a look. So they will go and have a look at what's causing that radiation. Um, and then what they'll do is they'll cause diversionary uh, or uh, scarecrow actions around the object to move people up to get rid of it, which is what we would do if, if we were in the same shoes. And the thing is, is that this, this is not hard to believe because our own stealth aircraft, can, well, our drones, can detect nuclear signatures on the ground when they are, you know, 30, 40,000 feet up in the sky. So if you're dealing with a technology that is much higher, they can probably do it from a much further distance. Um, and so I'll give an example. There was a, a story uh, where a family um, bought this bed. I think it was a bunk bed. Um, for their kids from like an antique shop okay. and they put it in the house and suddenly their house became active and the kids were all crying and screaming and you know all getting scared there were voices coming through the wall saying we're going to kill you and all this stuff uh, so the kids were really freaked out even the parents stayed in the room and got, also got freaked out so in the end they just got rid of the bed and guess what it all stopped and the reason why it stopped is because the bed's contaminated so when, when the, they moved the, the bed to the house, the objects detected it, went down, see what's going on. Oh, this shouldn't be here. Let's do some, you know, actions to get rid of it. So they caused lots of, you know, disturbing actions around it, which then scare the family to get rid of the bed. And then as a result, get rid of the contamination. And that is what the hitchhiker effect, I think, is caused by. So in the case of... Um... Skinwalkers at the Pentagon, where um, family members of those who were studying Skinwalker Ranch, living a great distance away, started to perceive um, in, in interesting phenomena and strange entities. Um, mm -hmm. How would that work? Would it be that the person who um, was studying the phenomena came home and infected or passed on? Yeah. Yeah, it's basically following the radiation trace. Yeah, radiation trace. Okay, yeah. and then the kids are taking it to school, and their friends at school are starting to see the same phenomena. So it seems like a it acts as though it's a an infection, like a yeah, a yeah, it could be. As I said, we don't know how if it is radiation, we don't know how it how it works or how, mm. but it does appear to be that way. Okay. It does appear to be that way. Um, mm. The clue is to start studying what kind of radiation or what sort of effect this is and um, trying to work out which equipment would pick it up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it, I think it is possible, but it takes money. Mm. You know, um, I mean, I've gone as far as I can. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've, I just had my paycheck. I just pay, I use my paycheck to, to do all this stuff. Uh, but it's like... Uh, if you really want to get serious and you need to get you need to get some serious hardware sensors and you know um and then you need to be there for maybe three months you know to to get all the data and considering you know these places are they charge 400 pounds a night some of them you know it is is and also you then you you're up against the fact that most of the owners don't actually want you to find anything then you don't want you to find any radiation or anything because they're happy to keep it the way it is. It's a moneymaker, you know. But the problem is, is, is that the mainstream media, the mainstream TV shows, um, that's what bugs me the most, really, because they, they've got the budget to go a little bit deeper, but they don't. Um, and the problem is, is that the more, as time goes on, the more extreme they become. So, you know, there was a documentary a while ago, uh, Demon House, where they took a, an engineer and he was in the basement for just a few hours and then he got multiple organ failure. Oh. And then he has in hospital for a long, long time. And he's probably screwed for life, one way or the other. But the, the TV shows don't actually say, oh, hang on, let's stop for a minute. What, what's going on here? You know, they just close it and move on to the next one and do the same thing again. Um, and really what it, what's going on is you've got the, you've got the type street spheres operating in these houses in the, in the basement, they're giving off high energy emissions, you're down there, you know, um, 
doing your thing, and obviously the high energy emissions are giving you cancer. You know, there's other signs where, which really makes me laugh, where I see these uh, ghost hunters over here uh, on TV, and they take haunted objects home because that's, that's the same thing. It's the same thing. It's contaminated objects. Uh, they take these haunted objects home, and then they go, "Oh, I feel really poorly, and I've been in bed for three days, and I've got no energy, and I feel really, you know." And I'm saying, and in my head, I'm thinking, "You're fucking crazy," because what is happening is that the object is radioactive and it's killing your blood cells which is why you've got no energy and why you're in bed and why you're in such a mess and then they get rid of the objects or take it away and they all you know gets back to normal again okay. but you see they don't want to they don't want to look at it in a technical way they want it to remain this mystery because it makes money yeah what would you do if you were given the opportunity, say, for instance, to be flown to Skinwalker Ranch with your equipment, given a bunch of money or to join the team? And, and um, what would you go about doing? There's a few things you can do. Um, well, number one, you won't be able to find anything um, by their approach they're using right now, I don't think. Because um, these, these objects are everywhere. It's just you can't see them, right? So you cannot set up cameras in certain places or, or trap cams because they, they know they're there and they'll just work around them. The only way you'd be able to really get in touch with them is electronically. So what you would do is you'd use uh, radio transmitters or microwave transmitters and start trying to see if there's any uh, signals going in and out of, of the area. Right, so if it's high energy emissions or, or microwaves, or I mean, no microwaves are there because they've detected them, right? So, see if you can find out what what's going on with the microwave. Is it transmitting a digital signal? If it is, you know, sample it, see what the computers make of it, and work with it. And then you, if, if you can figure out how the signal or, or what the message is saying, uh, then you can send them one saying hello, okay. and you'll probably get a hello back. And that's how you roll. That's how you, that's how you would do it. You don't get anywhere by digging things up, because you know I, I don't think that's that's the way to do it. You do it electronically, and that's 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 how I would approach it. Anyway. Have you got a hello back when you've tested it at your end? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, what hap when we do stuff it is pretty scary actually. It's um, in, I've only done it a few times because it is a bit is a bit much. Um, so, so back in 2016, I think it was, 2017, I was going all over camping, actually, um, going over to my friend's house camping, we'll be doing tests in the woods or in up the, up the hills, in real isolated places. Uh, and I was using my new ideas and how things might happen and work. And we're doing this stuff in the middle of a of a, of a tunnel in the in the in the wood. And there's in this wood, there's no animals. There's there's no you might see the odd little dog, you know, like a like a like a fox or something, but no deer or anything like that. And we're there doing it, and suddenly this guy comes out of the woods and just looks at us, and he's only about five foot tall, four foot tall, real weird face. Um, disappeared out of nowhere and disappeared. And uh, that that's when it gets a bit much. You're like, oh, you know. And that's happened a, few, a couple of times, actually. Um, a real weird face. Please explain a little more how... Well, it wasn't from... It wasn't human, no. Okay. In what way was it not human? Big, massive eyes. Uh, tiny, tiny face, big eyes. Um, very skinny. Uh, but tall, so yeah, certainly wasn't wasn't from here. And we both saw it, and uh, yeah, it, it freaks us both out a bit, really. Like you know what? Because the thing is, suddenly you realise how how isolated you are, and you're like, it's it's like see, it's like seeing a lion in in, in the woods or a, in the jungle. You're not sure if it's going to look at you and sniff you or kill you, and that's that's kind of like the situation you're in at that point. You have like this awkward standoff. 
it's like you you see it and they see you and then you sort of turn around and walk away it's not like you got there and start doing sign language or anything like that you just say okay you know and then you walk away how many um, times did this happen patrick in different ways but um five six times that's pretty consistent yeah yeah I mean, we, we were doing tests up the hills, uh, 4,000 feet up a hill in the middle of nowhere. Um, no, not even a, a phone signal, nothing, you know. And suddenly, because we're testing out this, this uh, light I, I came up with, and uh, suddenly we're getting these high, real high frequency static fields surrounding us and going, going around us. And the sensors were picking it all up. And then suddenly you're hearing EVPs, suddenly, I'm talking, and then another voice was talking my my voice, and it's not me talking. Um, then thing, then stones will start getting lobbed against the wall. Um, you will start seeing things out the corner of your eye, like a shadow will move across, you know, like a cross. Um, last time we did it, we saw six shadows all, all standing there watching us. Um, so yeah, it does get a bit freaky. It does get a bit freaky. And we're doing it again, actually, um, in July. So I've designed a new unit now. Uh, I'm going to try that in July. In uh, where was it? It's, uh, we're going to be doing it in um, Rendlesham Forest where the UFO land. Oh, goodness me. So, yeah, uh, it's going to be a good one. <laughs> so yeah, make your will before you go there. Um, so you got to, uh, you're going to film that one, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. I'd love to see that. It's very exciting. Um, but yeah, it is, it is, I mean, we, we went to, uh, we went testing the, my light unit in a place called Screaming Woods, uh, which is said to be the UK's most haunted wood. Uh, and we're in the woods and, just, you know, pitch black, turn this thing on, and suddenly within 40 seconds, you're getting static fields being getting picked up again. And then suddenly all the tree branches around you start falling down. Like, and I don't mean just falling down, I mean like they're being thrown at you. Uh, and one just like came down here and just missed me. Um, and it was happening constantly all around us, like just And uh, we're standing there going, oh fuck, you know. So that kind of crazy stuff. But it's only for a short period and then it stops. So it comes to have a look at you as a sniff and then and goes away but while it's looking at you all these weird effects will happen um also hearing like um footsteps coming up behind you um like someone you know looking up behind you and there's no one there um that kind of thing but right now i say i'm testing my the code i developed uh, i got a few a couple of teams who are testing it out and they're getting really good results with it i mean they, they literally get their sensors press the the code give it 30 seconds and, and everything's lighting up and responding to interact, you know, like they'll ask a question and they'll get an answer all within 45 seconds. So um, this is, uh, you've developed a hypothesis and you put it to the test and you have repeatable results. Have you yeah. thought about writing a paper on this and presenting it for peer review? Um, it's, it's possible, but I need to do, you know, the book, explains the process of how I got to this position, right? Mm. Um, but to go deeper and deeper, you need a big budget. Mm. As I said, if, if I got a big budget, then I could get the real hardcore, the hard data mm. and say, it's, you know, three gigahertz coming out of this building at this time. And it's, you know, and, and so forth. Um, and that's, that's, where you, that's where you can then write a paper. But what I'm saying is, is that the model I've come up with is consistent and it makes sense. And when we do our stuff, weird stuff happens. And you know, when you've got consistent uh, results from people, you know, people who, who are just teams who are just interested in trying your stuff out and they get results, it's like, you know, in the middle of a field, not in a haunted house, you can do it in the middle of a field and get EVPs in the middle of a field. Wow. Mm. So that's what I'm saying is, is uh, when, when, uh, when, when people are trying stuff out and they're getting results, you know, 
it's, that's, that's what I want to see. I, I, I actually give a lot of software away because I want people to try it and, and just film it and see what happens, you know. And if you know people who want to do that, then I'm fine. I'm, I'll happy to give you some software. Um, but yeah, I just want people to, to try it and, and experience it for themselves. Uh, everyone who's given, done it so far has got good results. So where can one find your software to test it? Uh, so basically just join my Facebook group, mm -hmm. uh, Quantum Paranormal 21st Century Analysis, yep. um, and just ask me. And I'll say, okay, what phone you got? Okay, there you go. Simple as that. And um, so you have a, a caution manual of um, do's and don'ts before... Yeah, it's all in the... All in the um, all in the... Um, yeah. So it's a it's an app that you can use on your phone, right? Yeah. Oh, great. Well, I think you've been very generous with your information here, and um, I thank you very much. This has been super informative. And it, do you have anything to say to someone like Brandon Fugel or, or Bob Bigelow? Bigelow knows this already. Okay. He he doesn't he doesn't know about I don't know if he knows about my stuff, mm. but I guarantee you that his his research has come up to the same conclusion because okay. he um, posts um, tweets which are consistent with my findings. Wow. Okay. And most people, most people don't sort of connect the dots, but yeah, it's like he he uh, did a tweet I think a few months ago mm -hmm. uh, saying my, our little contribution, and it's like a CCTV of like a something whizzing around in a room. And people just sort of dismiss it, you know. But if, you know, you got to remember, Bigelow is a serious guy. He's a he's a billionaire. I think he's a billionaire, and um, he owns. You know, he's he's developing space stations for NASA. Yeah. So when you have a basically a defense contractor saying this, it isn't it isn't dust. It isn't a mosquito. It's something bigger. It's just he's just been indirect with information. Uh, and what he showed was the type three sphere, which is what's in buildings. That's what it was on the tape. And uh, that's what people see in these buildings. You know, it's that simple. Um, so Bigelow knows. Does Elon know? Probably. Um, yeah. In fact, yeah, he does know. I don't know he knows, actually. Um, so the big, the big guys know. It's just, it's just, the mainstream media are just stuck in a constant format. Yeah. You know, like uh, every ghost show is the same. Yeah. You know, there's there's been no real progress in, on the subject. It's basically going to a house. Oh, it's, it's some guy died here 300 years ago. It must be him. I'll tell you a funny story. There was a there was a, <laughs> a ghost show where I won't, I won't mention the name, but they went to this place and they thought someone had died there and it was haunted, right? And it was haunted, stuff was going on. But then when they actually did their bit of research, no one had died there, right? So that completely buggered their show, right? So what did they have to do? They went down the road in their four by four SUV, you know, or blacked out thing and go, uh, anyone die here, you know? And they found a house down the road where someone died and they say, oh, it must be this guy who just pops in and out. Yeah. But people are dying the all the time. This is what you know, gets me. Who selects which ghost to come back when there's billions of people dying over the Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in fact, I think I haven't got the maths in front of me, but I did the, the, the maths on it. And it's it's stupid. The the numbers, mm. if 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 there was just a one percent return rate, mm. right, we would be inundated. Mm -hmm. It's that simple. Yeah. Uh, even if, you, if it's like less than one percent, like half a percent return rate, we would be inundated. You know. Um, so they are, and then you see a house will become active somewhere, and the researchers go in, and they have to go back four to five hundred years to find a story that kind of fits. You understand? And it, it's like, are you serious? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Oh. And all, you, all it does, all it does is mm. bang on doors and throw things around. Yeah. You know, it's not and make you feel human. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't make any, the, what it, what it really is, is human beings by nature, we always relate unusual things to something we recognize mm. or we want to relate to. That's how our brains put it in a box, you know, um, when in fact it's, it's not that at all. It's, it's actually a, it's, it's something much bigger. Um, there you go. I think on that note, we'll call it a, <laughs> an evening. It's an evening for you and morning for me. And thank you for your time. I really look forward to seeing you again. And um...